Have you ever tried to have faith in God and felt you were running into a barrier? Have you ever felt there was a brick wall between you and this Lord of heaven who's supposed to be so loving and kind? Well, today, you're going to meet a remarkable author who's written about dramatic encounters with God. And you're going to discover the real secret behind this barrier. It may well stand up in a place you haven't looked at. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Welcome to It Is Written, Nicole. We're delighted to have you on our program today. Tell us a little about your background and how you got started in your line of work. Oh, sure. Thank you, Gary, and thanks for having me on. Um, I, I call myself a dramatist, so I studied theater in college and then began writing. And um, the, the really fun thing about writing your own material is that you really get to you know, be in control of the process from start to finish. So my background is theater. I wish I had taken more writing courses. I, I've taken a few in my adult life after college, just trying to get better, but um, sort of started in that, uh, in that vein, just uh, writing and, and, um, and acting. So what about your book, Dramatic Encounters with God, Seven Life-Changing Lessons of Love? What, what made you focus on that? Um, I think being a dramatist, um, reading the Bible, it comes alive in a different way when you see these encounters that Jesus had with individuals. It's really like, in many ways, it's really like a play that unfolds before the audience of, you know, first century people that were there to see it, see it happen. So I was definitely drawn to the drama, the story, the personalness and the intimacy of the encounters. So what's the major theme here? What do you zero in on? The power of love that in each of these encounters, these people got to see a glimpse of love that they had never seen before, whether it be the woman caught in adultery or the man with the withered hand or the gathering demoniac. They're very personal, intimate encounters in which Jesus steps into their world and shows them a glimpse of God that they had never seen before. So tell us about some of those dramatic encounters Jesus had and some of those life-changing lessons. Well, take one, for example, of Jesus um, teaching in the synagogue where the Pharisees were sort of set to trap him and he sees the man with the withered hand. And it's interesting because amidst everyone else whose hands were whole and perfect, obviously Jesus' compassion in his eye is drawn to this man. And the Pharisees really want to catch Jesus. And the crowd, of course, that starts to follow really wants a miracle. But Jesus really wants, seemingly wants to do something different. And I think the work is in the man with the hand as he's called to stretch it out, which is a faith lesson for all of us. That is, it's the stretching out that separates faith from fear and woundedness from being made whole and authenticity from pretense. But deeper than that, Gary, I think he wants to do something in the hearts of the Pharisees. Because just like the man whose hand was withered, these religious leaders, their hearts were withered. Maybe a wound or an injury had taken the life out of them, but for whatever reason, they wanted to keep their withered hearts tucked away from Jesus, just like the man who wanted to hold back his hand. And Jesus speaks right into that. And the Pharisees couldn't accuse him of anything because he just spoke to the man and said, stretch it out. Nicole, what a wonderful encounter. Can you share another one with us? One that's particularly meaningful to me is, is just this, this encounter that Jesus has with the, um, the gathering demoniac. Now I say that laughingly after I said it, it, it's particular to me, not because I feel I'm demon possessed, but it's such a personal encounter with this man who, who the Bible says, lived among the dead and he cut himself with stones. And it's personal to me because I see a lot of, um, a lot of people today, young girls in particular, that really use self-mutilation as a form of expression. They cut themselves when the pain becomes too much. And here, 2,000 years ago, we see this man living among the tombs and he's cutting himself with stones for the same reason, some sort of deep emotional trauma that causes him to cry out. And Jesus, once again, speaks right into that with a very pointed question. He doesn't say what's wrong with you. 
get your life together. He says, what is your name? And the man answers, legion, for we are many. And it really opens the door for us to ask, what are our names? What are the names we give to ourselves? Cutter or um, fat or ugly or um, all sorts of horrible names that we have for ourselves, much like legion. And Jesus speaks right through that, really to give the man not only a new name, but a new life. How about your own experiences, Nicole? Have you seen Jesus coming through in dramatic encounters? Oh, my goodness. Um, the, C.S. Lewis says that pain is the megaphone that God uses to rouse a deaf world. And I really resonate with that, only because it's, it's really through our suffering that we're really united in Christ in so many ways. It's when we suffer or when we hurt that we really look to see God in our lives and where is he or why don't I sense his presence and it is in those moments I think that the power of love intersects our world to where we can see God in a very visible and personal way and this book really focuses on the on the power of love doesn't it it does I I, I love the Huey Lewis song you know you don't take you don't need money you don't need fame you don't need no credit card to ride this train and it's really true, and with Christ, it's, he came to give us a picture of God that we had not seen before. We had seen many pictures of God through the Hebrew faith as it has come into our world and has shaped us, but when Christ came, it was Emmanuel. God said, now, here's a picture that I am with you, and I'm with you in love. I haven't come to scold you or tell you how to behave better. We've tried all that. I've come to show you how much I love you, that I'm with you and I won't leave you or forsake you. Now, Nicole, you've told us a little about your, your, your work, but you're also a mother, right? You've got two <laughs> little children. How does that impact your, your work? You mean in terms of trying to find five minutes to go to the bathroom with the door closed? I mean, it's, it's hard to write a book when you have little fingers under the door. Um, but a very, just along the lines of what we were talking about, about Emmanuel, God with us. Um, I, I was driving on the freeway with my young son when he was about 18 months old and he had a few words and, and one of them was out. When he was in his car seat, he, he would say out quite a bit. So I was on the freeway, lots of traffic, very, very busy freeway. And my son starts crying and moves from crying to screaming to wailing and I'm on the freeway I can't really do anything about it and he's saying out 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 and I know he wants out I, I mean I'm you know I, I can be dense but I, I get it out and I pull over on the side of the freeway I'm wiping my own tears because I can't help him I know that as a loving caring mother that I can't get him out for two reasons one because he'll never go back in if I get him out on the freeway in the car. But second, because it's not safe for him to get out. It's not safe for either one of us to be stopped on the side of the freeway with cars whizzing by. So I stop the car and I climb in the back seat with him and I say these words, Buddy, I can't get you out, but I can just sit here with you for a little bit. And it was as though I, I heard God say the same thing to me in my own words. Sometimes I can't always get you out, but I can be there with you. And I think that is Emmanuel. And I don't think I could have had that experience um, with God, my own dramatic encounter, if you will, without having had kids that I love as much as my own life and would want to help and face my own limitations at that at that moment and offer them the only thing that I really had to offer them, which was myself. Nicole, there are many writers, many speakers out there. What has been most rewarding about your kind of work? Oh boy, yes, you're right. There are a lot of writers and speakers out there. And, and a hard thing as a writer and a speaker is to get past that voice that says there are a lot of writers and speakers out there. Um, because that inner critic will say, do you really have anything different or unique to say? But I think as we allow the message of the gospel to use our gifts and our bodies, 
then the expression of that is quite unique and quite important. And one of the things as I get to talk with people, I get to talk with a lot of people that are either young in their faith or that don't have a faith. And, and it's interesting because many will say, you know, I decided when I was 12 or 13 that I wasn't interested in, in God. And I say, that's interesting. Were, were there other decisions that you made at 12 or 13 that you're still sort of sticking to today? I mean, if you had married somebody at 12 or 13, would you think, wow, I made a decision that's gonna last me the rest of my life? And so I love the opportunity I have as a writer and a speaker to ask people to consider faith in their adult lives. Maybe revisit that decision they made when they were 13 or 14 and, and they felt like the rules of God were too heavy so they decided they didn't want God until these dramatic encounters begin to happen or their hearts go through some suffering and then the door is a little bit cracked to say maybe it's time to revisit that decision. That's a privilege that I love as a writer and a speaker to help people think about faith in, in their adult lives. So. Nicole, you talk about dropping your rock. What <laughs> is that all about? Um, it, it's, it comes out of dramatic encounters where in this encounter, a very famous encounter of Jesus when the woman caught in adultery is brought before him. Um, what I call a dropping your rock moment, love gives us a chance to choose. You see people come running with their rocks. Everybody loves a front row seat for someone else's sin. And we all come running with our rocks and we all have the sins that we love to hate and our rocks come easily for us. But then comes the moment when you come running with your rock and someone that you love is in the center of the circle. And love is giving you a chance to choose at that moment. When your son tells you he's homosexual or your best friend confesses in agony she's having an affair or, or, or your, your sister tearfully describes an abortion. Oh my goodness, your grip on your rock tightens and you really want to tell them exactly what you think of that sin and in some ways just try to, try to beat it out of them. But when Jesus scribbled in the sand that day, he really wanted to show a group of people that there aren't enough rocks in all the world to beat the sin out of it. And he wasn't going to let them try so they could feel better. And so love gives us that chance to choose love over judgment, which is what, what Jesus did. And I kind of wonder if when he scribbled in the sand, he wrote, my rock is bigger than yours, <laughs> so you can drop it. Nicole, it's been a pleasure to have you with us on It Is Written Today. And so, thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you, Gary. Nicole Johnson is quite aware of issues that interfere with faith. She's dealt with the things that turn people away from religion. And she's very good at helping us take another look. Maybe you're having a tough time with faith in Jesus Christ. Or perhaps you know people who are going back and forth between church and the world. For many people, one of the biggest issues is that there is something deep inside that they are cherishing. Something that they know they shouldn't be doing. There's often some sin in our lives that's creating the problem. It's very common for us to be hiding something that's keeping faith at a distance. So I'd like to suggest to you how we can overcome that. I'd like to show precisely why Jesus is the greatest solution on earth for those dark things that keep holding us back. Here's a striking example. It's something Nicole talked about. And I'd like to expand on this gospel story found in John's Gospel and chapter 8. It's the account of religious leaders dragging out in public something they claimed a woman had been hiding. They made her stand before a group of people gathered around Jesus at the temple. And they proclaimed, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Notice what they said to Jesus in John chapter 8 and verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? These Pharisees believed they had a trap here. Their rival Jesus could go down either way. If he said, don't stone her, 
they could claim that he was denying the law of Moses, betraying Jewish tradition. If he agreed she should be stoned, they knew that that would horrify many people. Jesus didn't just maneuver around to try to get himself out of that trap. No, he did something to get this shamed woman out of the trap. Instead of yelling back at these uptight religious rulers, he bent down and started writing things in the sand. Now, biblical scholars have seen this. Jesus writing down the sins of these Pharisees, the things their rituals were hiding. After all, Jesus said, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. They were staring at him. They were looking down at the things he was writing in the sand with his finger. And they began to walk away, one at a time, beginning with the most elderly, the most dignified. Jesus could now straighten up and ask the woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? This terrified, weeping woman looked around and said, No, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This encounter has a climax that comes out in many other gospel stories. You know what it is? Grace. Grace is the climax. Not condemnation. Not some religious debate about the law. Not hiding a sin. Not making excuses for a mistake. No. Simply grace. You see... Jesus can insert His grace into any situation, any predicament. And that's the best news you're ever going to hear. We've all struggled with dark things inside us at some time. Sexual problems often put up the biggest barriers. Marital issues can keep us shut down. Adultery often compels us to hide. But this Jesus, He can walk up to us and say in effect, Here's your sin. It's laid out in front of me. And here's a new life. You can walk away to a much better place. Christ's forgiveness, Christ's grace, is the crucial element that enables us to move from a problem to a good life. Glenn Kuhn was a pastor who really grasped that grace in a special way. He could express it quite well. And he saw a very big impact. One of Pastor Kuhn's church members, a man we'll call Ralph, left his wife and children. He went to a nearby city and rented an apartment for himself. This, of course, caused quite an uproar in the church. One of the elders came to Pastor Kuhn and exclaimed, That man must be dealt with at once. Everyone felt Ralph needed to be strongly disciplined dealt with right away. In a sense, they were holding those stones, staring at a man caught in adultery. Well, Pastor Kuhn promised he would phone Ralph and make an appointment. The church leader thought that this was a terrible idea. Call him on the phone, he said. If he knows you want to talk with him, you'll never get to see him. The only way to get close to that man is to come on him suddenly like cornering a rat in a room. Pastor Kuhn thanked the church leader for his concern and then, after much prayer, called Ralph. And this is how he began the conversation. Ralph, I'm your new pastor and I have some wonderful news for you, something you'll like very much. I'd like to see you alone. Can we meet at the local cafe? This man was declared by all as unreachable. But somehow he said, I'll be there tonight. And what do you know? At the appointed time, Ralph met with Pastor Kuhn privately. The minister turned to him and said enthusiastically, I have something wonderful for you, as I said. It's nothing financial, but I came to bring you victory over sin. At the words victory over sin, Ralph seemed to slump down in his seat. He stared out the window into the darkness. The man seemed to be wondering, is this minister trying to gather information to use against me? Pastor Kuhn continued talking 
assuring Ralph of his genuine concern. He mentioned other people he'd known who'd recovered from serious moral failures. The minister talked for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and still there was no response. But he persisted in hope, in grace, saying things like, I know you'll bounce back. I believe you will be rescued. There is hope. Finally, Ralph dropped his head and he began to sob like a child. He turned to the minister and said, Pastor, I don't believe there's any hope for me. Pastor Kuhn put an arm around him and quoted these words from 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The pastor was fanning that tiny spark of hope. He continued sharing scripture promises about God's acceptance, forgiveness and cleansing. Finally, he was moved to say with tears in his eyes, I believe God has a plan for your life and I believe you're going to do a great work for God in the future. Suddenly, Ralph raised up his head and looked the minister in the eye. Pastor Kuhn, he said, I'm going home. A few days later, Pastor Kuhn spotted Ralph's son in the supermarket. The minister strolled over to where the boy was picking up some vegetables. He bent down and asked quietly, how's everything going at home? The boy immediately straightened up and said with a beaming face, Dad's back home again. Yes, it turned out to be a very happy ending, an ending to a big mess, to a dark deed that everyone thought would ruin his family. Grace can indeed make a dramatic difference. The grace that flows from Jesus Christ is what has that power. The Messiah who managed to rescue the woman caught in adultery is still pulling off rescues today. He's still turning the darkest deeds upside down. Have you been struggling with faith? Have you been feeling there's a distance between yourself and that God up there in the heavens? Why not be honest? Why not deal with the real barrier? Why not lay out that thing inside you've been hiding? Jesus Christ is the one who can handle it. Jesus Christ is the one who can turn a persistent mistake into a good life. He can turn whatever has kept us limited and hidden for years into a bright future. I invite you to reach out to the Christ standing by that temple in Jerusalem. Open up to that Messiah who extended grace to that woman everyone scorned. Confess everything to Him. Lay out whatever's deep inside you. Place your trust in His grace, that amazing quality that can turn everything around. Take that step now as we pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for sending your son down to our neighborhood. You've placed him right beside us, right beside our problems, right beside our barriers. So we confess our sins. We open up to you about all the stuff we've been stuffing inside. We don't want to hide anymore. We place our trust in you, our Saviour of the world. Amen. If you've been inspired by this week's program, be sure to join us again next week when It Is Written will present another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. It Is Written truly is changing lives around the world. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.